下一节的议程——国际合作特别兴趣小组。让我们欢迎台湾网络资讯中心丁启平副执行长为我们主持。Welcome back. The next session is Cooperation Seek. The moderator is Joey Chen, Deputy CEO T W Nick. Joey Chen, please. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Joy Chen. It is my honor to be here to host this session. As you know, this international cooperation special interest group is really talking about a broader internet topics. And today, we are choosing the theme on environmental sustainability for the ICT. Now, this is not really a new topic, but we really need people to pay attention and act on that. With that, we have wonderful speakers today. And、uh, I think you're going to have a great time to listen to their knowledge sharing as well as their experience. Now I have to、uh, pass the greeting from original the first speaker, which is Nicole. Nicole comes from a big variety of different titles that she has. She was going to give us a global perspective about this topic, but unfortunately, she has a big conflict that she's not going to be able to make it. But passing her greeting. And her knowledge is sharing with her slides. I think you can find later on the website. Okay, so I'm gonna just、uh, give more time to my three wonderful speakers who are present here. The first speaker is gonna be Leo Li. Leo is coming from EAP and、uh, from Hong Kong, but he's now stationed here in Taiwan. He is a、uh, very very senior right now. He's a senior instructor, but his background actually from the IT. Almost all the different aspects he has done. With IBM, with Lucent, with Avia, and、uh, HSBC Bank, I think the list goes on. But today he's going to talk to us.、Uh, I say green data data center. But he says, "Well, Joy, it's more than that." So,、uh, how much more and how much in depth? I'm going to passing the microphone to Leo, and the floor is yours. Please share with us on your concerns and、uh, your knowledge with the the sustainability on ICT. Environmental. Thank you. Thank you, Joy.、Um, can you hear me? Everybody can hear me, Joy. Okay, huh? Thank you. Now my name is Liu Li. I come from、uh, EPI company,、um, and、uh, I take this chance very, very much appreciate that、uh, Taiwan uh, NIC, uh, uh, you know, give me this opportunity to share some information about this subject. Uh, myself, I actually I come from Hong Kong, but I, as Joy said, that I'm、uh, now stationed in Taiwan.、Um, he, she also mentioned my background, so I don't want to use waste your time. Just、uh, without any ado, just go into it. Okay. Now,、uh, can you see my presentation? <laughs> can you see my presentation? Good, good. Ah,、uh, let let's go into it. Now my topic is、uh, environmental sustainability of the data center.、Uh, so I will talk about、um, you know the environmental issues of the data center and associate the whole industry,、uh, not only you know go inside the building data center.、Uh, so I will cover four areas. The first one is how bad is it. So basically, I will go to recap the current situation. From a border view and, and do some projections so based on the statistics. So we did、uh, see the projection going into the future. How is the situation to be,、uh, you know, to going to happen? Now the second is、uh, the related standard and guidelines because if we want to move somewhere, we need to have a direction, right? And the number three are some practical suggestion. How can we reduce the power consumption in the data center? Because data center use a lot of power. We all know that. Uh, number four is a relatively emerging topic、uh, and getting a lot of、um, attention now. Is、uh, we we talk about the carbon neutral data centers. Okay, so uh, uh, this is is a must <laughs> slide, which is our company <laughs> requirement. So let me introduce briefly our company EPI. EPI is a data center、uh, service company. It's an expert company. So we basically provide.、Um, Uh, data center design and build certification. We are the number one global、uh, certification company for the data center, according to the TIA Nine Forty Two. For example, in Taiwan, the highest、uh, grading called rated four or tier four data center、uh, 
from Zhonghua Telecom, the data center is in Banqiao. Okay, this is the highest level data center in Taiwan, which is certified by us. Uh, and uh, we also certify the data center operation um, that another uh, telecom operator called Chief Telecom, Shifang Dian Xin, uh, is also audited by us. And, and we provide the most welcome data center training classes around the world. Um, you know, we have classes talking about how to design, build and operate a data center training around the world in America, Middle East, Asia, everywhere. We have all the different customer, you know, IBM, HP, Intel, Microsoft, Foxconn, government, you name it, every, everyone. So, um, and we operate directly or to our partner uh, in the 100, more than 130 locations around the world, okay? Um, I know everybody is going to sleep, so let's go into it. <laughs> so first area, how bad is it? Let's talk about the impact of data center to the environment. Um, now there's a study talking, taking the, the, you know, the statistics starting from 2010, so it's about 10, 11 years ago. And uh, they starting to record all the information, the, the readings, the records, and then do the projection all the way to another 10 years, right, to uh, 2030. Now, so we can see there are three, three lines, right, projections, so the minimum, uh, the optimized, and the worst case that uh, we will anticipate in 10 years coming that, uh, you know, the, the uh, data center growth, uh, that will be three to 10 times, that will be a lot, right? Now, but if you look back in the you know, past about 10 years, from 2010 to 2018, that one actually was uh, better than what we expected. So the you know the fifth almost five times plus uh, growth of the data center, but uh, the power was only uh, rose the rise up for about six percent. It means that a lot of people working together, <clears throat> joint effort to make sure that we're under control. Okay, this is a good news. And besides the power and actually data center emit a lot of CO two based on the cooling system, IT hardware, right? So actually, they provide a lot of CO2. You know, CO2 is a, a global warming issue, right? So actually, it's overall data center provide, produce pollutions. Now, um, and uh, we just mentioned the data center grows so much. Why? A few reasons. Number one, because a rise demand for the digital service. For example, we all know that aware that because of COVID-19, right? Most of people are being forced, you know, for or being pushed whatever reason, whatever reason, you need to stay at home. So when you stay at home, you need to work at home, right? And doing other things through the internet. From last year, 2020, from February to mid of April means that six week, right? Half, one and a half months, the internet grow 40%. Crazy, right? It's just crazy. Other things like um, um, mo mobile devices, right? Everybody now have smartphone or even iPad, iPhone, Android, you know, more more and more devices. IoT devices, right? The IoT take over, you know, the monitor detection control in a different industry. So we get more and more devices require IT information. And also because, you know, a lot of time we stay at home, you know, conference meeting, uh, you know, Netflix, uh, entertainment, so all on internet. We all know that, right? YouTube video. So just grow. And um, other things like cryptocurrency, right? Blockchain, 5G, we all know that. So they just, you know, going up, going up. And this uh, take a certain percentage of global electricity uh, use, right? And we will see, keep the trend will go up definitely. Now, besides the power usage, actually data center use a lot of water. Uh, for example, the data center we have, you know, is a physical building, right? So we have a lot of IT uh, devices, equipment, they need to be under a very constant control temperature and humidity uh, uh, room, right? So that's why we need to cool down. And then using, uh, you know, big data center, definitely we go to the Chira Pran, right? Chira Pran means that using the chill water to cool down the, uh, the heat of the IT. And, um, you know, a lot of a building you see on the rooftop, they are the cooling tower. So we transmit the hot water, take away the heat and go to the ceiling. And then the water tower will allow the water to spray out and then discharge the heat, reject to the outside environment. So that's why a lot of water is keep evo e evaporate, you know, go into the steam. So the water is being waste. And then we keep adding water. <clears throat> so that's why you use so much water, you, we may not aware. 
And the water uh, uh, shortage is actually, uh, you know, the largest global risk from an economic point of view. Um, so we can see that more and more issue. And hidden water usage, not only the data center, but the power generation, because we need power from a power company, right? So one kilowatt, a single kilowatt electricity from the nuclear plant, traditional coal, make it, uh, you know, coal nuclear fuel may require more than 55 liters per one kilowatt, right? So you know that, and how much, you know, in the data center, we're talking about 100 kilowatt, megawatt, it's just crazy. So a lot of heat and usage we do not see in our eyes, but they are, you know, back end from the power company. So, so overall, we talk about, you know, a few things, but the why we, you know, now talking about green sustainability is because they collectively, they create so much impact to our environment. Okay. Uh, for example, everything add up, we call it collectively called carbon footprint. We all know that, right? Fairly familiar. And this one will generate so much greenhouse effects. So they generate the global warming and they create so much extreme weather. And we already see that, you know, crazy strong typhoon, you know, too hot, too cold, extreme weather. We all know that, right? Uh, so that's why we need to do something. So for example, some countries, they are already trying to impose regulations. So by law enforceable to push uh, uh, some of the uh, company, at least the government office by themselves, or provide a funding tax incentive to motivate or right either way push it positive or negative way. Then everybody need to do something, right? Green. So let's see um, what are the guideline standards, right? Now, if you go to internet, you will find there are so many standards and guidelines, um, and where to start, how to start. Now, each standard definitely, they are different scope purpose. So for example, ISO 14,000, uh, which is more, more focused on the environmental management system, Europe, code of practice on ICT and facility all over, you know, overview, research, uh, BREEAM, talking about the green data center, uh, when you go to into design build, ISO 50,000, that the overall energy management system. So both I, ISO uh, 14,000 uh, and 50,000, basically, they have plan, go to a plan to check act system. So this is a continuous improvement framework. So uh, there will be uh, ISO 14,000 focus on the resource use waste management and 50,000 will be more on the business energy uh, strategy. Now, another <clears throat> hot topic is called PUE. We all heard about it, right? So PUE is power usage effectiveness means that how much power you go into a data center and how effective we use it. So the formula is very simple. Total facility power means that total data center power usage divided by the total IT. So you come up with a number, right? It's more than one, definitely, but the lower close to one is better than two, three, four. Water usage, um, you know, besides the power, we have water. So basically we have annual use water liter per kilowatt hour. The water is used in the air con, right? Evaporation, we already talked about it, cooling tower, humidification, changing the humidity. So they use a lot, we use a lot of water and actually power converting the energy. Besides, besides all this thing, um, you know, we also have the transportation of the waste stage. Now there are many waste stage when we build a data center and operating them. For example, uh, you ship in the equipment, right? They come in the paper boxes, right? The pallets. Uh, fiber cable in a written reel, right? Training manual, right? Documentation print out there, a lot of things. So that's why we need to handle all of this because they are part of the waste. So how can we reduce, right? Um, the energy consumption? Let's see a few practical trips, tips. Where to start now? First thing we need to understand what are the distribution. If you look into some survey, we'll find it. Uh, um, besides the IT equipment, which is uh, the largest uh, power uh, usage, that the cooling is almost 40%. So if you really want to lower the power usage besides the IT, of course, we go into the cooling improvement, right? Lighting, not much, right? So what we can do is checking the guideline. If you go to the SRA, SRA is American uh, uh, Aircon Engineer Society, which they are the most important uh, aircon engineering society. So they recommend the, the, the temperature cooling for the IT is 18 to 27. So there is a range. Now in the past, uh, many people go down to 20 or 21 and 22,
But if you go to 24, 20, 23, 24, 30, even 25, still within the range, right? Right? But it's, you will reduce the power, right? So we can also use economizer, which is called a free cooling. Free cooling means that using the outside environment to help to cool down the data center. For example, now we are in almost summertime, almost gone, right? But summertime, we can go up to 30 plus degree. But if you're in a Chinese New Year, say January, February, then they can go down to a few degree, less than 10, right? So theoretically, we can uh, bring the cold air from outside to bring into the computer room, directly cool down a, a machine. Then we call it ASI free cooling. But if you're using the outside air to cool down the chill water, so to let the, the, the cooling water directly circulate instead of turn on the chiller machine to convert, you know, using the refrigerant or the heat exchange, then complex system just run the pump to push the water. Of course, we, we save energy, right? So this is called water side free cooling. Many techniques. Uh, another common technique, what we can do is uh, doing containment. Containment is very simple, sounds professional, but it's very simple. Just in the IT rack rows, push a door, put a door, put a ceiling, so you isolate the, the cooling air trapped inside and isolate from the hot air outside, right? Easy and very effective, but you know, very cheap cost, very effective. It's almost a very basic, uh, very popular now. And another thing is quite interesting, a lot of people I cannot say, but it's quite often the people, um, most of the data center, when they install the equipment, they have, you know, they like to separate them, they have a gap, right? Um, and then they have a gap, it's okay, but a lot of time the people do not put the blanking panel. So if you have a gap there, the front is cooling and the hot air is the back, right? So as long as there are temperature differences, you will create airflow, you can't stop them. Because this is the basic principle of a wind, right? A wind. So when you have temperature difference, they will mix up together, you can't stop them. And then you're losing the cooling and energy and money. So that's why just install the blanking banner, right? It's fairly cheap, but you will save a lot of uh, the, you know, the, the problem. Also close all the unwanted patches means that on the cool, uh, race floor, if you do not have the cooling requirement, don't put perforated panel, okay? Sometimes you just, you know, get used to the whole row, right? And then the equipment are not there, just put it first, right? Uh, we should not do that. Now, um, other things is uh, we can uh, do the saving on the UPS, use a scalable. What is scalable means that you don't get modular or you can buy a smaller UPS rather than a big UPS. Because data center is normally grow gradually. It's very few people on, uh, you know, say 500 rack data center, on day one you fill in 500 racks, very few people, they will put okay 200, 300, and then allow the phase two expansion, right? So on day one, if you only have 100 rack, but in a big room, 500 rack, you put in a big UPS, but there's no, no IT usage. So why you do that? So we can use a modular according to the, you know, graduated upgrade, then we will do what we should, what we need, right? Using a better high efficiency UPS means that better UPS, of course, uh, and more expensive, but they will help you, you know, throughout the lifetime. Um, the better UPS, they can, uh, you know, comply to the water temperature and humidity means that we need less aircon. The truth is, turn on the fan, came in the airflow, you do not um, use a lot of energy, but aircon converted the end, uh, temperature and cooling the temperature and converting the humidity, you use a lot of energy. Just imagine your home, you use a fan compared to an aircon, which one take more electricity? Easy, right? Easy, right? Then if we can allow less control restriction on the temperature humidity, we save money. So, you know, many things we can do and we should do. Better power factor and multiples of resilience. Nowadays, uh, a lot of the data center go to 2N. 2N means that you have two active UPS all the time. But if the power is so stable and you keep running two machine for running, there's no need to. So that's why you can go to two and we got two active or one active, one standby. You know, we can do, a, you know, a little here, a little there, right? Lighting, right? Uh, using LED lighting, they use less power, but brighter. Lights color on the wallpaper floor, actually refraction. So you require less light intensity. So saving money. 
uh, nobody there that turn off the light, right? Um, buy new equipment, I, new IT equipment, usually, uh, you know, when you have a new IT equipment, their power requirement will be more effective, I should say. I cannot say they lower the power, not necessarily, but more effective with higher power and uh, better high efficiency AC-DC converter because every IT equipment, your AC inside, they need to convert to the DC to the circuit board anyway. So this is also a loss, right, when they, we are doing the conversion. <clears throat> of course, uh, based on the PUE, we already said that, right, the formula, it's <clears throat> total data center power divided by the total IT, right? So the, this is the ratio, right? If the IT is low, now the PU number becomes very high, easy, right? So that's why, how much is the utilization, right? If the IT is high usage, of course the PU will go low. So become effective, just a simple math. Uh, so we need to keep on measurement, right? There's a policy and keep track on how the IT is using. If they do not use much power, <clears throat> why do we turn on all the aircon and UPS, right? Modular, right? Server virtualization do a lot help. Now, nowadays, a lot of new data center going, you find that very interesting. The data center become bigger, but the machine becomes smaller, less fuel, right? Because we virtualize. So if you have 100 application running on one hardware server, of course, it's save a lot of energy uh, from the uh, 100 server hardware. And the hardware, you know that the server can, you know, starting from 500 watt all the way go to 100, 1 kilowatt and go to the blade or, you know, the more, sand storage to can go to 15 watt kilowatt and 20 kilowatt is just crazy so that's why if you minimize the number of hardware then of course we save a lot of money it's very effective um, but of course they will increase the complexity because there is one application on one hardware you die is one application now 100 application die together uh, okay <laughs> another one is um, less people uh, talk about it is how to manage the data now data is virtual yes but how do we preserve the data is physical right we need to put the data in the paper in the hard disk right a hard disk you need a bigger machine and then there will be a lot of a, uh, a copy of the data right murals way back and like back and forth right so actually we use a lot of storage so the sand storage, we all know that, right? So there are major growth area between the both of the size means that the cost and the energy consumption. So if we can have um, good policy to, uh, uh, you know, re reduce uh, unnecessary deprecation, of course, or rapid access, right? So, you know, that will, re you know, uh, uh, reduce a, a, uh, uh, the power requirement a lot and cooling, right? So that's why we should uh, regularly review the storage requirement and how to do the documentation, right? If the documentation is getting old, you know, use the old, go to archive or even, you know, delete them, right? That will help a lot. Now, so we should always analysis the storage, you know, like uh, other uh, power cooling uh, uh, capacity management, just normal everyday work, right? And water, water we should uh, capture and storage the ring water nowadays, actually we can do so, right? Uh, 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 take it back, right? The cooling tower, you, you have a capture the steam and then, uh, you know, and then we do condensation, right? Uh, a lot of things that we can do. So uh, one more topic is quite interesting. That is a roadmap to the carbon neutral. So what is that? Actually, they come from many, many places. The first one in 2018, that was uh, the United Nations in the government panel. They said that uh, they, the, they will have 50% chance to keep them in check. So basically, we want to control them. And they have a target that by 2050, which is about 30 years later, the global emission will be zero. Okay, sounds good, right? Mm, sounds nice. <laughs> but how about uh, other people, like the people travel, car, driving a car, MRT, right? And then uh, yeah, we already saw, talk about the solid waste, right? Um, um, so, for example, the paper, manual, you know, unused equipment, retired, then there are ways also. Um, there are other things like in the com commercial area, which is uh, the European data center operator, 
uh, and trade association, they only they also have the target, right? PoE, water, clean energy, blah, blah, blah. So everybody is doing, uh, trying their best effort. For example, Microsoft, right? Very famous. This one is a very famous um, experiment. So put the data center in a capsule, right? Basically, like a submarine, boom, put into the water to dissipate the heat into the uh, natural cooling by seawater, right? Uh, energy we use is um, uh, to reuse the energy, to collect the energy. For example, not everywhere hot, right? You go to Canada, you go to Russia, you go to Europe, a lot of time. In the winter, they're very cold. So we collect the heat energy from the IT, blow to the office, right? Right? Nice, right? So we can use a thermal storage, store in a different timing, right? Left and right, left and right, right? We know that uh, the energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Conservation of energy principle, right? But we can convert, right? <clears throat> so other new uh, renewable energy, uh, solar, you know, wind, hydro, um, uh, tidal means that water wave pushing the generator, something like that. Uh, all this energy, some of them are quite location uh, dependent, right? So like the Taiwan, you know, it's an island, you know, surrounded by the sea. So we can use a lot of wind, water wave, right? So um, actually all these are not new, to be honest. Uh, the problem is they are not stable. You wind, right? The water wave, day, night. So that's why we can use that, but how can we store them is another issue. So the hyperscale, you know, the big data center like Google, Apple, they already do a lot of work. Like Facebook, they target to, you know, three quarters of using renewable energies. Um, so they measure, they have some kind of uh, endorsement called energy attribute certificates from US, Europe, you know, everybody doing their work. Um, we can also do the power mix because now we just mentioned there are different power source, right? Different power source, um, what we can do is different timing. For example, this is a data center in different time, right? In the midnight, not many people using the usage that we're using uh, 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 procured wind energy. But in the daytime, in the noontime, this is the peak, right? Then we're using the grid non-renewable energy, you know, power company, right? So mix and match. So here, there, here, there, here, there. So there's not a single act, uh, work that can, we can do. We can also use the hydrogen fuel cells. We all know that hydrogen is a natural air, right? So we can take out from the natural air and combine it with oxygen through the catalyst, the electric uh, chemical reaction. They will produce the electricity and byproduct water, but they're all recyclable. So, right, this one is also come from uh, Microsoft, in my memory is correct. So they do a lot of experiment, right? Another big trend is the OCP. Now, OCP is getting more and more um, focused. And they are not popular everywhere yet, but definitely they will. Why? <clears throat> because, number one, they focus on saving energy and money and material. Number one, right? Money is a big incentive. And looking, look at who are the members. ASU, Taiwan, right? Facebook, IBM, Intel, Nokia, right? You can't escape from them, right? So that's one. That's one will definitely push very fast. And this one is a, now is a two point oh. If my memory two point oh three point something like that. So what they do is they uh, they they come together to to redesign the infrastructure, right? To optimize airflow, free cooling at the server on a you know circuit board chassis level, <clears throat> larger fans. Uh, using DC power supply because the power is AC, right? So you go into AC, DC, DC, AC. So they're using the uh, inside of right, they have uh, DC power supply. So basically they skip the UPS because UPS, you have a uh, conversion, right? So AC, DC, DC, AC to stabilize. So you can skip the UPS, you straight into the equipment, you save uh, uh, the power and put the resilient is on a software instead of, you know, double machine, four machine, something like that. And uh, saving costs, right, of course, happy. So ability to work on a number of manufacturers instead of one. Now, you know, you buy Apple computer, Apple IBM server, HP are all different. But once you everybody comply to OCP, so you are circuit put into my chassis, right? Sounds good, right? <laughs> Dream. Let's see how fast we can go. Um, and how to manage the data center, we can use the AI 
right? Auto, uh, because inside the operating of the data center, to be honest, the work inside of running a data center is repetitive, right? Every day, almost doing the same thing. So the AI can learn from there, you know, the people issue the tickets, how to do the patching, correct the soft record, you know, uh, same. So the, the AI are very uh, uh, appropriate to manage the data center running the DCIM. Now, DCIM is data center infrastructure management has been using for many years. Basically, they monitor all the power cooling, you know, the fan, bell speed, something like that, to put in a, like a dashboard, right? Right, so a UPUD number, but instead of send the report to the people to make the decision, AI do it, right? The good news is uh, we are running more effective for data center, but the bad news is uh, some people get fired, by the way. <laughs> so we, they can upgrade to other job now. Sorry, I just, just a joke, okay? Now, so Google is committed to use that and there are other people, everybody is doing that, okay? So by saying so many things, but we are not there yet. So that's why the government and grid, you know, power company, data center, telecom operator also, right? Because telecom operator use a lot of data center. So let's work together. And um, this is my uh, presentation. So thank you for everybody uh, time. So my time is up now. <laughs> Hand over to Joy. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Leo. You know, whenever I turn on my laptop or checking on my cell phone, there's a lot of the science and technologies behind the scene. So this is really a wonderful thing for us to really hear what's happening in the data center and how can we reduce the energy waste. I think this is great. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my second wonderful speaker, uh, Professor Ting Wei um, Ting Wei Tan. Professor Tim is actually the chief executive from the Supercomputer Center in Singapore. I know from our AP NIC sessions, he shared many wonderful things. So I asked him to share again with our Taiwanese community. Uh, I know he has a lot to share and his focus is going to be on the decarbonization, but that's not it. It doesn't have to be the limit. So I'm going to give my time to uh, Professor Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joy, for in inviting me to speak at the uh, 36th uh, TW NIC IP Open Policy Meeting, specifically focusing on the cooperation SIG, um, and, and to talk about how the Internet's environmental impact, how we in the uh, Internet service provider space, as well as the people who operate data centers, can address energy efficiency and environmental sustainability, how we can decrease our carbon impact, even as we increase the size of our data center from small rooms with uh, multiple racks to huge rooms like the one you see here on um, the slide. Um, and in particular, in the next slide, I will explain how myself as a data center operator of a supercomputing center in the next slide, <clears throat> We address the issue of decarbonization of our supercomputer data center. Of all the data center, the supercomputing data center will use the most number of highest density of uh, computer chips using megawatts upon megawatts of power to compute uh, high performance computing uh, resources to provide it for our research entities that come under our support. Therefore, it's important for us of all data centers that uh, we, uh, Leo has spoken about, a supercomputing center must pay the most attention on how we use less energy, how we make use of green energy, and how we find ways of distributing the computing load, not just in our own location, but to other places where we can make use of the free cooling, which he mentioned in his excellent talk. Thank you, Leo. In the next slide, I would like to explain to you how uh, when I operated my data center for a one petaflop supercomputer, in the last six years, we were able to continually make, take steps to reduce our energy consumption. Uh, just to let you know, uh, our budget was for three years. I was able to operate on a three-year budget for five and a half years. So this shows you the net effect of cost savings that you can achieve if you pay 
close attention to how you manage the energy problem. There is tremendous benefit. So how do we use less energy? So Leo has mentioned by making use of more efficient chips and we, should, we can compute less, store less data if possible. But sometimes the sunk cost in building uh, the storage systems, for example, and the compute is already there. So plan in the long-term range, we must always find ways that we can provision for resources just to the amount that you need. In other words, predicting accurately how much resources you need to serve the needs of your end users is very important. And progressively upgrade to more energy efficient chips. In the next slide, let me focus on how we in the National Supercomputing Center uh, make use of a petaflop system that uh, I show here on the side. Uh, uh, 1,288 nodes that we have, right? We have 13 petabytes of storage and we have accelerator nodes like GPU supporting up to nearly 280 million core hours. We have now progressively moved to the next slide, our next generation technology, which will increase nearly three times the number of CPU cores and incredible large number of very hot GPUs. And this represents the effort that we take to make use of new generation, more efficient, in this case, AMD chips, which are more energy efficient. And maybe one day we might move even to ARM. In the next slide, I will quickly show you how uh, we have now moved to, in the last six years, uh, focus on energy efficient data center. Very much like what Leo has mentioned in everything that he has spoken. Uh, I have something to explain to you how this, almost everything that he talked about, we have looked into, right? And uh, so now let me go through how we use less cooling, how we improve our heat transfer, and how we operate the, uh, the data center efficiently using IoT sensors combined with big data analytics and very soon artificial intelligence techniques and including digital twin uh, technology to model our data center and run scenarios uh, on, on how we can operate the data center more efficiently than we currently can. And finally, I will also explain how we make use of industrial symbiosis. Now, I am a biologist by training and I currently am a professor in the Department of Biochemistry in the National University of Singapore's medical school okay so don't ask me about how i become ceo of uh, nscc but i am wearing two hats at the same time so we are very familiar in biology about symbiosis how the waste product of one animal becomes the input the food of the next animal if we can apply this technology uh, 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 this uh, concept which all living forms are familiar with and apply it to our industries the output of one uh, or the uh, waste products of one industry, if you couple it together with another industry that can use your waste, then maybe we can be even more efficient and more effective uh, than some of the ideas, which are uh, the excellent ideas that uh, Leo has spoken about. Now, let me start off with how do we use less cooling, right? In the next slide. Now, my supercomputer center has by no choice, we have to operate at level 17 of a high-rise building. As you know, I come from Singapore and the land area is very limited. So we have no choice but to stack everybody up. And our data center at level 17 now has a big problem. How do we pipe water and how do we pipe energy up there? But we turn a disadvantage situation into something that is advantageous. We operate our data center uh, at 45 degrees and that is very very hot and this 45 degree dry he makes use of a dry cooler at level 18 one floor above us hot water rises we make use of this ability to dispel heat from our dry cooler we don't use evaporative cooling systems even though we are in the tropics singapore is very humid and therefore it is a waste of our effort to try to eject uh, heat in the form of evaporation of water. We make use of dry coolers and an internal closed loop 
that avoids almost zero water loss in terms of ejecting heat into the atmosphere. And because we are at level 17, the winds are pretty strong and Singapore is an island, so the sea breeze will take the heat away. And to avoid concentration of heat at the land and livable areas at the lower floors, we make use of one megawatt of power to power our computer and the cooling as well. And we make use of pumps to pump heat uh, up to these dry coolers and eject the heat. So what happens in our data center? Within our data center, we have cold aisle and hot aisle containment, both of the recommendations made by Leo. In the next slide, you'll see how we do it. I have three methods of cooling, direct to chip, warm water cooling. Air conditioning is a, air is a very inefficient conductor of heat. So we directly pump warm water at 40 degrees directly to the very hot chips. GPU chips are very hot. Uh, uh, CPU chips are also very hot. So we focus on targeting where the hot areas are and take the heat directly from the hot places rather than trying to cool everything. Go direct to where the heat source is. And these semiconductors produce a lot of heat. So we transfer the 45 deg 40 degree cold water into these chips, take the heat out, it gets warm to 45 degrees, and it goes up to level 18, where the dry coolers now will emit the heat. It is like a car radiator, we transfer the heat out to the atmosphere. Because of this, we have minimum requirement for air, uh, air conditioning systems, right? But these make use of chilled water from our central supply. The other thing is that not all chips can be cooled directly. We still need to provide some degree of cooling for devices that cannot be have heat extracted out. So we make use of rear door heat exchanger, whereby there is a heat exchange between chilled water and uh, the hot devices that emit heat that, that heat that does not allow us to have direct to cheap cooling. In the next slide, I will show you how we make use of direct to cheap cooling. We have a, a supercomputer and a, and a, and a 300 thousand uh, CPUs. Huh? And uh, so we have all these little um, uh, cooling systems, which are some of you who are uh, uh, gamers, they, you will know how this is this works. Huh? We use an Azatec fan that directly connect compact contacts the uh, CPUs and pull out the heat. We pump in cold water and we suck them out. In the next slide, the water, the hot water that is generated from these CPUs, and I have over several thousand nodes here, will then go upstairs and then to these uh, uh, dry coolers, and these dry coolers do not evaporate water at all. So there is zero uh, wastage of water in a tropical country like Singapore, where water is extremely precious. Now, the out outside temperature ranges from 25 degrees at night to maybe 33, and because of global warming, we're increasingly seeing temperatures of 35 degrees. Even at the hottest 35 degrees, the hot water that we throw up is at 45 degrees, there is a sufficient nearly more than 10 degrees of temperature gradient for us to emit the heat out from our di uh, direct to cheap cooling system. So in the next slide, you will see how at our data center, we uh, uh, do, we, we are in the process of upgrading to a new data center now. And our new data center makes use of no air conditioning, uh, by the way. Can you imagine in hot tropical Singapore, we're not using air conditioning at all. We are using ambient temperature to run our next supercomputer, which is going to be something like 10, 8 to 10 times more compute power than we have right now. So we're going to have an aggregate of something like 8 to 10 petaflops from the one petaflop system, which you just uh, I just showed you earlier. And we also will have coal containment and one uh, chorioid containment. In the next slide, you will see that we have achieved a uh, green mark, uh, 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 platinum award 2021. Now this area uh, that uh, we have uh, will be operated hot and uh, we will make use of the same direct to chip cooling system. But what about the other parts of the data center in area B where we have other servers, right? What do we do with that? So we make use of again, rear door heat exchange technology, but this time super super up with something called thermo siphon. And this will increase the efficiency of the extraction of heat from these very hot systems using a cool logics technology from our own homegrown technology company, which actually make use of our supercomputer to create a model of their cooling system 
and run simulations of computational fluid dynamics to optimize the design of their cooling system. So we are making use of a supercomputer to solve these cooling problems. In the next slide, I will now explain to you how for using efficient operations, we make use of so-called intelligent data center. And this is also explained to you by Leo earlier. In the next slide, I will explain how we do this. Now, if you concentrate on uh, the, uh, uh, the, the from the left to the right, we make and top to bottom, we make use of intelligent sensors, uh, integrated intelligent sensing system in our data center information management system. We have 6,540 IoT sensors that measure temperature, uh, humidity, uh, etc., wind, and so on. And we also make use of big data analytics. So the issue here is that can we map our whole data center and find out where the hotspots are? and focus on balancing out the hot spots and the cool spots so that we have a, a more even and balanced cooling framework. We also have uh, in supercomputing, many of jobs are batch jobs, right? And my data center right now is 95% utilized. So it's very, very hot. How do you even the load? The moment there's this cool spot, if you have a thermal aware job scheduling, you can send the job not to the already very hot nodes, but send it to the cooler ones. In this way, you balance out your load. So on the right-hand side panel, you will see this intelligent energy optimization method will help us, instead of cooling everything at 18 degrees, we bring down the cooling to the peak, the hottest part of the data center. Let's cool it just a little bit more. Don't need to overcool. Better still, some data, some parts of the uh, different times of the day, different loads, and sometimes the temperature fluctuates. Match the cooling according to the ups and downs, the valleys and the peaks of the data center requirement. And then that way you will save a lot of energy, unnecessary cooling. We also find ways of doing digital twin modeling. And here on the right hand side, you will see how we monitor the temperature, the airflow within our data center and find ways we can improve the design of the data center by identifying the hot areas and the cold areas and how to prevent the mixing of the air, the hot air and the cold air by providing physical barriers to segregate and contain the cold and separate it from the hot. As a result of this, the PUE dropped from 1.36 to 1.08 after the optimization and retrofitting. Next slide, we will show how we run a smart network operation center in order to control all and monitor the parameters, uh, including CPU utilization, power consumption, humidity, temperature, chill, water, etc., and integrate it into a DCIM system uh, integrated with a BMS, building management system, for our supercomputing center, integrated with the IoT sensing system together with all these features. And in this way, by monitoring very carefully how different parts of the data center perform, we are able to operate a smart network operation center that will help us re continue to reduce our PUE to as low as we can. So you heard we have used zero uh, water loss. We now have very low PUE of one point, okay, one, not always 1.08, maybe 1.1. 1.1 means for the one megawatt of power we use, power our data center, we use 0 0.1 megawatts of energy to cool the system. Now we are saying that is not good enough. We must do better. Now in the next slide, I'll show you how we are exploring green these data center architectures by combining with some uh, organization called the Singapore Liquefied Natural Gas uh, um, Company. This company uses liquefied natural gas and gasifies it. Liquefied natural gas is minus 162 degrees and they need to warm these gas in order to be about 10 to 20 degrees before it can be used in our power plants. So what do they do? They use seawater at 29 degrees and then they warm it up to 30, uh, 30 plus degrees and they throw it back into the sea. We told them, why not do I build a supercomputer data center next to your wastewater outlet? Sorry, uh, uh, they, they throw the water out at 5 degrees below, sorry. 29 degrees, they throw it out at about 25 degrees. Can I use the 25 degrees to cool my 40 degree data center? 
And the answer is yes. So we are now working with a consortium of colleague, uh, companies in order to explore this possibility of using, in the next slide, something called industrial symbi symbiosis. This is a picture, uh, a Google map picture of this liquefied natural gas receiving terminal. We are proposing to harness their coal energy that they, they eject into the sea and let us receive the coal in order to cool our data center. So that is a possibility of harnessing up to 300 megawatts of coal energy. Wow, isn't it? And this is, they throw it away. So this is free of charge, right, to us. So they talk about free cooling. This is a tropical region enjoying free cooling from, not from the atmosphere, but from another industry in the form of industrial symbiosis. So it's not about starting the circular economy. We are talking about circular economy for energy through industrial symbiosis. Next slide, please. So I've spoken about how we, uh, uh, we, we use less energy, right? Next thing is we need to address the issue of how not just using less energy, but using greener sources of energy. And as Leo has mentioned, uh, there's plenty of options available out there, including solar power. Um, uh, and now we are investigating possibility of using LNG itself, which we warm up for them, right, in the company uh, that we propose to co-locate our data center. And then we are investigating uh, hydrogen sources, as Leo has mentioned earlier. So in the process of, uh, we are in the process of now exploring in the next slide, the possibility of proposing a hybrid land combined with water. That means putting a data center over water. <laughs> so water is a very good conductor of uh, a carrier of heat, uh, 4.2 kilojoules per, per, per gram, huh? very strong heat, heat uh, absorber. So therefore we are thinking that if Singapore land is so scarce, uh, maybe we, we have already explored uh, a data center on land, right? And we are also data center up in the air. Uh, so we must explore the so-called Chinese saying, Hai Lu Kong. Uh, we are looking at the water now <laughs> to be the location where uh, we can put our data center. So here, this slide, we are saying that we are right now uh, exploring the possibility of uh, pr uh, putting our hot computers over the water and throw out the heat into the uh, reservoir and make use of uh, uh, solar panels. Uh, we have already started the process of creating several hectares of a solar panel farm, not on land, which is very precious to Singapore, but over uh, a reservoir. So by covering the reservoir, every day in Singapore, if the sun beats down on the water reservoir, they, we will lose a lot of water through evaporation. If we cover it up using solar panel, wow, we reduce the loss of water. At the same time, we generate electricity, green electricity, that will feed into our data center, which we will eject heat into the reservoir water. By co-location, co-locating uh, the environment, we can better improve our impact on the environment. In the next slide, we will see how we are exploring the, our Pongo Digital District of using floating uh, uh, solar panel. Now, uh, Leo mentioned about Microsoft submerging their data center underwater. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. We're not going to put it in the sea just yet. Floating is good enough. When there's a global warming, the water level rises, the floating data center will float along with it. And not only that, we hope to eventually explore the possibility in the next slide of achieving net zero carbon usage of our future futuristic data center that combines floating data center technology together with green energy and the coal energy uh, efficiency, extracting coal energy from LNG and making use of solar panels uh, for greener electrons. We are able to do this because we can operate our data center in a distributed manner. In the next slide, you will see how we do it. We have already achieved the possibility of distributing our storage system from our compute system. Right now, it's separated by something like uh, 30 or 40 meters apart. Our disk, computer disk, uh, our computer uh, compute part, nodes are actually diskless, and our data is on uh, and, uh, data uh, 13 petabytes of storage on another location. We can extend this further and further. In fact, we have tested it in 2014, 2015, and proven that we can make use of long-range InfiniBand, not in TCP/IP, uh, 
but InfiniBand protocol to extend the distance between our computation nodes and our storage nodes. And we can make use of long-range InfiniBand to interconnect supercomputing centers throughout the world. And we have achieved this in 2016. We created a ring around the world using InfiniBand technology and we're able to launch things like InfiniBand Cloud. So we call it InfiniCloud. Someday, all computers in the world will talk to each other and construct something called the galaxy of supercomputers. In other words, what we can do now is instead of Singapore hosting all the compute power that, that we need, in the next slide, you will see that there is a possibility now for Singapore now to ex a supercomputing center in Singapore to partner with Finland, export our CPU requirements to a very cold place that they make use of hydroelectric power together with the free cooling from the a very cold Arctic uh, weather. We can now consider the possibility through these international connectivities that we have already constructed with 100G links from Singapore to Europe, Singapore to Japan, Singapore 100G to US, and Singapore 100G to Australia. So we are essentially a global hub of 100G connectivity in the scientific uh, network uh, of uh, national research education networks. We can make use of these networks connectivity in order to transfer our jobs, not just to the water where our floating data center is, but also global distances that extend all the way to cold places where the level of energy efficiency is so much better. We make use of quantum key distribution networks in order to protect these links. And we're already in discussions with uh, satellite operators in order to provide us the QKD network protection that we will need when we are able to export our compute power to anywhere in the world. In the next slide, this shows how our possible data center technology roadmaps will evolve over time. And in summary, in the next slide, let me conclude by the saying that we are making use of a strategy of combining using less energy with using green energy and using compute somewhere else in order to achieve this mission that is upon us to make our data centers more greener, more energy sustainable and achieve carbon neutrality and if possible, carbon negativity. We will be discussing this in our next supercomputing conference in 2022 uh, from March to the third, uh, 1st of March to the 3rd of March. And I hope to see all of you there uh, in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ten. Um, I don't know how you do it. I know that you are a professor in medical school. You run a supercomputer center and uh, um, decarbonization, which you've been talking about is amazing. and. Uh, I don't know how you do this, but you obviously done a lot in saving the world. Thank you to saving the earth. So my third speaker, um, Michael, um, Michael, let me make sure I said this right. Michael Hugia, right? And uh, um, I respect him when I learned about him from the APNIC conference that he's a very respectable environmental sustainability expert. And uh, um, he has a lot of the dedication in this. And uh, today he's gonna be talking with us on this topic and uh, representing, I guess it's a Sustainability Digital Infrastructure Alliances, which has already 65 members in there. As we speak, there may be more that's joined. And maybe after today's talk, there's gonna be more people showing their hands to join with you in saving the earth, okay? So without further ado, let me uh, pass the microphone to Michael. Michael, it's yours. Thank you so much, Joy. It's very kind of you. Let me just bring up my uh, my, my slides. Just a moment. Just make sure I can't Let's see if they. Yeah, you can see my slides. Yeah. Brilliant. Just a second. Okay. All good. Brilliant. Thank you so much again, Joy. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Joy said, my name is Michael Ogia. I am, I'm based in Belgrade, Serbia, and I am the Director of Communications and External Relations for the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance, SDIA. Um, just before I begin, I just want to say I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. 
uh, Joy, you are way too kind to me. Thank you. And I am so excited as well to just, I consider myself a friend of Taiwan and I'm very happy to, to be here and to be part of, to be presenting for this community. And so without further ado, let's begin because uh, the two presentations before me were, were so good and, and really like they hit on so many layers that we need to address. Mine is going to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more general. And so it's going to be um, for those of you, especially here that maybe are not so involved in the data center space or whatnot, this is a bit more for you as the end user, but of course we will get into um, data centers as well. So just a quick outline and oh, Excuse me. I wanted. I have a uh, timer, and I want because I, I want to make sure that I don't go over time. So, a very quick outline. I just I want to give an overview of ICT sustainability. So that's uh, so that's not just um, uh, the uh, data centers and whatnot, but it's really information and communications technologies, the entire ecosystem. And then I want to go into three challenges that I've uh, that I discuss for digital infrastructure sustainability followed by a specific challenge for Taiwan, and then lastly, wrap it up with some recommendations and conclusions. So let's get into it. So uh, the overview of ICT sustainability. So let's start here. The fact is that the journey from an electron to an Instagram picture, especially given the outage that occurred yesterday, uh, is very, um, very on point. The entire journey spans 30 plus industries and many layers of technology. So for instance, you have the enabling infrastructure, what, uh, what my colleague spoke about, electrical power generation, we have the rare minerals and materials, metals, etc., buildings and land, data centers, um, but then you, uh, sorry, and then you have the, um, sorry, so the enabling infrastructure, apologies, is everything that is underlying, uh, that is very, very um, key to basically any kind of infrastructure. Then we have the layer of digital infrastructure, which is the fiber and mobile networks. You have the data centers, the internet exchange points, IT hardware, servers, data storage um, facilities, uh, etc. Then we have the, and then we have enabling digital technologies. So that's your mobile phones, your PCs, your laptops, the Internet of Things, smart watches, um, the virtualization um, enablers. Then you have, for instance, data analytics, your AI, your crypto. All of that falls into this category. And then lastly, we have, uh, we have the digital economy, and that's the applications, the platforms, marketplaces, e-government portals, etc. All together, this this digital uh, economic value chain is more than uh, 13.7 trillion USD. So it's, it's, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of investment. Um, and if we, it's not really hard to understand why, because for instance, this was what happened in one minute of, of the internet in 2020. Um, as you can see, there were, um, Seven seven thousand six hundred and four. Um, uh, sorry, seven hundred and sixty four thousand Netflix hours watched in just one uh, one minute of twenty twenty. And of course, it was maybe a bit different because uh, every more people were in lockdown. So of course, it's going higher every year. This graph is released and it gets higher and higher. Um, one point six million swipes on Tinder, one hundred and ninety million emails sent. As you can imagine. All of this is quite intensive. So what is data and what does this mean for the environment? And so, of course, you have to appreciate the complexity of the entire digital uh, infrastructure ecosystem, you know, because uh, for two reasons. One is that the is that data is essentially the tangible outcome of electronic decision making over time. What does that mean, though? That means that although we use the ling language like the cloud, the internet is really the biggest machine that humanity has ever built, which spans everything from the submarine cables that are running under the oceans that connect continents to the satellites that are whizzing overhead. And of course, everything virtual connects to something physical. That is one of the most bedrock foundational um, points that we have to make. So, um, major ICT sustainability issues include, but are certainly certainly not limited to, 
energy consumption and its impact on the climate, resource use, uh, water, land, both of those have been uh, spoken about at length already uh, this afternoon, waste generation, electronic waste, pollution, um, etc. Then of course there's the mineral and the resource extraction, um, there is construction and transportation. You have to construct a data center. You have to construct a submarine cable. You have to transport a mobile phone from the factory to the consumer, etc. There's, of course, data transit and storage. If you access some, uh, 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 let's say, something that's on a server half a continent away from you, it needs to get to you. Well, that takes energy. That takes, it, it takes resources in order to facilitate that. It, it might be very quick for you but it's not, um, it's not without an impact. Of course, there's extensive supply chains, uh, and we'll get into this a bit more, but everything involved with electronics is very, very extensive. It's not a simple, you know, it's not like somebody's creating a handicraft and they do that right in front of you in your own eyes. No, there's no, it is very, very difficult to track these supply chains. There's, of course, a lack of design considerations, and that means that there's a lack of sustainability built into design. This is a problem that we've had for 40 to 50 years, if not longer. And of course, now we're trying to catch up on this problem. Um, production related to this, there's production, consumption, and end of life sustainability issues. And then lastly, obviously an impact on biodiversity and on human communities. So I don't wanna get anybody down, but there are a lot of issues that we have to think about. So let's take one case study starting at the start of the supply chain. Let's take metals and uh, minerals and metals. So for instance, this is um, a, a source from Fairphone, which is a, um, a phone a hardware manufacturer. And just to give you an idea of the kind of metals and minerals in your phone, obviously there's plastic, but then there are things like magnesium, there's tin, copper, uh, gold, and silver even uh, throughout uh, a phone. There's cobalt uh, and lithium in the, in the battery. There are rare earth elements like uh, neodymium and uh, others that are embedded throughout different components. Uh, tungsten uh, is not a rare earth element, but it, it's also there as well. So just to give you an idea, you know, I've got it right here. Like this phone has all kinds of things uh, in it that are sourced from all around the world, and yet it's in your hand. And so there is one, um, one specific kind of elements that I want to discuss just very briefly, and these are called conflict minerals, 3TG. That's uh, tantalium, which is coltan, uh, tin, uh, tungsten, and then gold. These, I, I bring these up, and I'll explain why in just a minute, and I should have done it the other way. But there are also other key minerals and metals that I mentioned, such as cobalt, um, copper, lithium, silver, and rare earth elements. So the, the why I bring this up is because, for instance, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there is an entire... Like you can, uh, there are organizations that map all of the uh, mining, um, uh, the, the mines rather, especially in Eastern Congo. And a lot of those are connected to, uh, to conflict and to uh, slave labor, child labor, etc. And a lot of those supply chains are considered dirty. And a lot of that, inf a lot of that is actually going into to the global electronic supply chain. And so it's, that's not to say every mine in DRC is not okay. And there are something called artisanal mines, which are small scale mines. Um, some of those have have better um, quality, but there is a lot of problems with the mining um, with the mining supply chain in, in the Congo and the DRC specifically. And this is one of, so there are, it's not just about the impacts that it has on the environment, which is open scale mining. It's not just about the impacts that it has on the, on, on carbon emissions, but it's also about the impact that it has on communities, humans uh, and human uh, and, and uh, biodiversity and human rights. And so this is just something for us to consider. Clean energy demand for critical materials is also set to soar um, as w the world pursues its net zero goals. This is from the, the International Energy Agency. Um, basically, we have an issue that we obviously need to, to transition to a clean energy future, but 
it's not so simple as like, okay, we just put up solar panels and we put up, um, we put up wind turbines. As much as I'm a fan of those, it's not. We can't just think about this in a black and white way because the fact is, there still needs to be a lot of mining for those things. There still needs to be emissions that will be generated to produce them, etc. I'm not trying to get anyone down. I just want us to think about this holistically. There is never just a simple magic bullet solution. We need to think about how all of these things fit together like a very intricate puzzle. So I just wanted to 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 kind of highlight that at the beginning of the production process. Now let's move to the end of life, the end of the production process, or rather the end of the life process. And that's with electronic waste. And now I've taken you to the DRC. Now I want to go to a place called Ogboboshi, Ghana, which as you can see is right here, uh, like toward the toward the beach. There's This is one of the major e-waste dumping sites of the world. And this is where a lot of, especially the global north, um, kind of sends a lot of the e-waste to this community in um, in uh, in Ghana, in uh, right outside of uh, of uh, of of the capital, and so we have this area, and uh, as you can see, there is scrap everywhere, and so much uh, um, e-waste gets uh, gets gets sent there. In fact, the world discarded 45 metric tons of e-waste, which together, if recycled, would have totaled U.S., uh, which would have it's totaled $65 billion in 2016. Um, sorry, just a second. I need to close this. There we go. Um, and then in 2019, that figure actually rose to 53.6 million metric tons, with only 17.4% um, 70, uh, of all e-waste generated, collected, and recycled um, throughout the entire world. This is not just Europe. This is not just East Asia or, or any specific part of the, of the globe. This is total. So we have a significant issue with this in particular. Just want to check my time. Sorry, just a second. Good. I'm all right. Now, uh, this actually just came out um, just over a year ago. The world's, yeah, the UN has actually said that um, that the world's e-waste is unsustainable, and this is and this is not one specific place. It includes China, it includes India, and the U.S. Um, and it's really uh, a problem because it's, although I, I showed you this image from Ghana, it's also uh, China, it's also India, it's also other parts of the world that are being that are having um, e-waste being sent to them dumped. It's called dumping, and it's a very big problem. It's basically like with most things, one part of the world, especially wealthier parts, um, just send their trash somewhere else, out of sight, out of mind. Now, there are three key challenges for digital infrastructure sustainability that really apply to the whole world. Um, the first one that I want to highlight is that actually Professor Lee already mentioned this. He kind of stole my thunder a bit. So, you know, but um, but the first is that ICTs are responsible for about two to three percent of all annual greenhouse gas emissions, which is on par with aviation. So as much as people say, oh, stop flying and do all these other things, whatever, as it relates to aviation, well, ICTs are basically just the same and it's likely to grow as well. And in fact, and this is where I think, you know, Professor Lee and I could probably have a, a good debate about this because as data growth, data growth is rising exponentially. And according to the Uptime Institute, demand is actually expected to outpace efficiency gains over the next five years. So th it's interesting because there's been this back and forth between researchers and civil society organizations and, and industry leaders about, well, what is the, the actual energy output? The fact is, we don't really know because there's so much variance across all the sources that exist that we don't really know what it is it what is it and it changes very quickly um, estimates that were done in the mid 2010s are now very out of date because the technology is changing quickly the uh, uh, awareness is changing quickly but the fact is this was actually a study done in 20 that was released in 2020 and um, even though uh, very much energy efficiency has increased rapidly and it has essentially plateaued in the sense of you know energy is not going up so much it is um, it is changing and of course this also means uh, as as he mentioned that there's a difference between data center energy use and the actual servers that are using energy so there's a lot 
that is uh, that needs to be taken into account. And because so many different methodologies and so many data sets um, vary and differ, this leads to different outcomes when it comes to trying to understand, well, what is the actual reality on the ground? In addition to this, um, in addition to this challenge, so one of the, the first challenges is really taking a holistic approach, which is exactly what my organization does, for instance, but it's what I've been doing for years. And sometimes people look at me funny. They're like, why are you talking about energy, like about utilities when we're talking about data centers? And I'm like, well, because you have to see it holistically. It's not just one thing. It's how everything is connected. We are living in a globalized, interconnected world. Our digital infrastructure is the exact same. And so if you think about it, there are really six key metrics, for instance, that we use, but that we encourage everyone to use uh, to think about how to measure the actual um, uh, impact of digital technologies. One is, of course, one of the most, uh, the easiest to imagine, and that's uh, carbon emissions. Um, the uh, the second is energy consumption. Third is the amount of electronic waste and other kinds of waste generated. Um, uh, four is obviously resource consumption, water, land, but but minerals and other things as well. Then the fifth is pollution. And then lastly, it's it's what we call the cost of digital power, which is essentially all the aggregate of computational capacity, storage, and network. And this is very much relates to socioeconomic uh, um, indicators and many other things. And so the idea is that if we recognize that the supply chains are complex, if we recognize that not just one system or one sector can address this individually, um, that is really the challenge because even if every single data center decarbonized tomorrow, that would be a fantastic goal, that would be a fantastic outcome, but it would still just scratch the surface of the actual problems at hand with ICT sustainability. It's a tough pill to swallow, but it is just goes to show how unsustainable the entire sector actually is. Now, the second challenge is that we have to make the business case for sustainability. What does this mean? Well, as you can see, for instance, this is something that SDIA is working on very, very clearly. And I'll explain some of these um, uh, uh, to you. In fact, actually, before I do that, I, I want to take it off. I don't want to distract anyone. Because the fact is, if sustainability is going to be incorporated into how we take things forward, from an econ uh, from a ec ecological environmental point of view, the fact is we also have to make sure that it makes sense from a business point of view, from an economic point of view. But our perspective, for instance, is that the most sustainable outcome should not necessarily be the most expensive outcome. That is wrong because there are so many environment there are so many externalities that are taken that are not taken into consideration when we think about pricing that actually the most sustainable outcome even if it's slightly more expensive is very prob most likely uh cheaper over the course of many years when we don't have to necessarily throw something out a very good examples with consumer goods if you invest in a very good pair of shoes that lasts you four years Maybe the upfront cost was higher, but then you don't actually have to replace those shoes, uh, like a, a pair of not so good shoes that were much cheaper. You might have to replace those uh, more often. So you actually end up spending more money. And so for us, making the business case for sustainability is so critical to speeding up the adoption of sustainable outcomes and really making sure that it's clear how these different parts of the value chain connect to one another and help not just benefit the the environment not just benefit the people and the communities of which digital technology is meant to to serve but ultimately make sure that we can actually protect um economics profit as well there's nothing wrong with the term profit in the sense of especially if you're saying i want to make a sustainable product that helps people that is better for the planet and also can make sure that my business operations can maintain themselves because otherwise if we have the most sustainable technologies but we can't actually make an economic case for them then they're not really that sustainable at all and so for instance this is just some of the 
um, examples of how we've worked with members and with some of our partners to do this. We've uh, one is, for instance, making a business case for heat recovery. So, for instance, supporting a government subsidy that would uh, subsidize buying a heat pump so that uh, data centers can actually then, especially in cold areas, and bear in mind, most of our members are in Europe. So, um, so being able to pump heat waste back into communities. It really solves many, many problems, especially now with the rising cost of energy and natural gas. And so, so there are, oh, sorry, I just meant to say there are all kinds of ways in order to actually make this business case and actually increase this. And that's something that we're working on, but that's something that uh, communities all around the world need to focus on as well. Then the third, I'm sorry, Joy, am I going too fast? Is this okay? I think we are okay, but if we can kind of like try to wrap up a little, because we, we do have a question from the floor and I want to make sure everybody gets to answer that. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so I'll, Thank you. I'll try to go a bit quicker. So um, challenge number three, of course, this is the third challenge, is political will and geopolitics. Obviously, if there's not enough coming from, pol uh, from policymakers, from regulators to make sustainability integral, to ICTs, it's not going to happen. And this is something that requires everyone to be involved with. Also, I say geopolitics because supply chains are highly connected to geopolitics. For instance, most of the rare earth elements that are mined and processed, that are at least processed around the world, are processed in China, which means that, that uh, for anyone that's working in the electronic space, whether procuring or manufacturing or s supplying, et cetera, that is a big hammer that can be used to uh, in, in negotiations. So there's really not too much more I need to say about this. I think it's pretty clear. Um, and I just wanted to point out real quick that, you know, that this is, uh, these are some of the um, suggestions, these are some of the ways that this is, um, that is, is coming out. So it's related to national security, economic power, uh, there are supply chain, uh, supply chain uh, shortages. The EU is looking to support its autonomy in the semiconductor um, space. So there's a lot of issues here that are that are related to geopolitics, security, poli uh, in, in general, and those are something that will, of course, impact sustainability as well. Now I want to go through this very, very quickly, and I'll be able to share my my uh, my presentation with you, so you'll be able to, be able to go through it by your on your own if you're curious one thing that is very very keen a key for taiwan and i'm sure i don't need to lecture you about any of this if you're there in taipei or anywhere across the island is that climate water and semiconductors are a major challenge why is this taiwan faces a difficult situation because semiconductors help keep it relevant globally but also require vast amounts of water. And I want to say that most of these comments that I'm going to say come from uh, a source that I took from, his name is Gautier, and uh, he published this earlier this year. It's a very interesting paper, and I, I s encourage everyone to check it out. But basically, this is the annual water consumption of chip manufacturers in Taiwan, especially TSMC. It is massive. And as you can see, the 2015 water consumption is is significantly eclipsed by water consumption from 2019, and most likely this will continue to go up. I'm going to kind of go through these a bit quicker because, again, no need for me to go through each and every one. You can see that on your own. But as you can see here, um, but I just want to say uh, this is actually uh, a list of the reservoirs, at least from earlier this year. I mean, they might have changed. As what is, and they're, the the reservoirs are running out. And so in 2019, Taiwan's exports amounted to um, 329 billion USD, which with the electronic uh, products accounting for 40 34.2 uh, percent of basically it's all of its exports. Um, the hydrology that once supported water-intensive industries, such as semiconductors, is now becoming increasingly unstable. And then, this is something I wanted to point out, and forgive me for all the text. Taiwan will face a complex choice, either increase its production capacity at the expense of other sectors and climate trends, exacerbating an already growing climatic and social fragility, or align the production capacity with the new climate situation in the region and prepare to better withstand the more violent events that are, uh, that are now affecting global production chains. So this is really a significant challenge that Taiwan needs to, to address, and I hope that it does 
address this because um, there are multiple climate, water, industrial, and economic situations that are kind of impacting Taiwan all at the same time. And this increase, you know, includes rainfall or the lack of uh, typhoons or the too many typhoons or et cetera, et cetera. So again, I will leave this to, to you to, to look through on your own. And the one thing I will say is that the current events demonstrate that the value of the semiconductor industry lies more in the stability of production change rather than increasing production capacity. And if Taiwan and, uh, Taiwanese industries cannot reason with the annual droughts, then there is little chance that the sector will remain sustainable in the medium to long term. So you can see how all of these different factors play in. And in fact, now because of chip shortages, um, hardware, um, uh, many of uh, hardware, you know, let's say procurement officers or um, uh, different businesses, they're actually stepping up the their their use of reused and refurbished servers, which that's much better for the environment, but not necessarily better for Taiwan. So, oops, sorry, that was my uh, that was my 25 minutes. So. Joy, would you like for me to run through these recommendations conclusions or shall I come to this at the end if we have a little extra time? So why don't we close now and I have the staff bring up all of you to the panel and here's a question from the floor and I ask I, re, I read the question and hopefully that um, Leo and uh, Tingwi and Michael you can maybe make a, a short statement as a closing and uh, I'll save the rest of the time for Michael to um, to give your recommend, final recommendation. And it is a very insightful um, view when you see the Taiwan's challenge. So the question from the floor is that if the data center is built using the natural resources for cooling, would it be still called green? And would there be any monitoring regulation on their heat emission? So, um, how about let's go with Leo, Tingwi, and Michael, and then you can finish up with your final recommendation as the closing. Thank you. Leo? Okay, thank you. Now, this is question is fairly valid. Uh, the, the problem is when we talk about green, 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 everything is just a brief concept, right? So some, <laughs> some people say green is different from another. So they will come down eventually um, based on two level of the requirements. Number one is absolutely uh, mandatory requirement this is illegal and the problem for legal system is legal is always behind so you set up a legislation you will not have both running before the technology right so they will always come behind sometime so running the the, the the, you know the legal then you require everybody go to uh, like singapore i heard the singapore government uh, talking about some data center go to the green mark which is PUE 1.2 or something right so so it's a legal means that they are restricted by the country so singapore law hong kong law you know europe law or, or france laws taiwan law so this one mandatory but they will only lay, lay down the platform on above you can do better which is based on the best practice right or the view to do better than the minimum requirement laid down by the law and and by you saying green again as somebody would say okay PUE is equal to 2 or 1.6 you know in in the professor he said uh, go down to 1.1 you know just blow my mind away so so <laughs> if, if layer, uh, really really right so uh, so so eventually, sorry to say that uh, it's, uh, you know, country basis and industrial basis. By the government, Understood. you are okay. easier, but for commercial, you would do other ways. Let's work together. Sorry, Thank I'm you, Leo. And I apologize to my speakers and my audience. I'm running over time. But so, um, Tim Wee and Michael, let's do a quick closing. Thank you, Tim Wee. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important point about whether you can be classified green or not. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, we just aim for as low a PUE as possible. We reduce our consumption and uh, we find new and novel techniques uh, to optimize our data center operations. And the proof is in how far we can stretch every dollar that uh, we, uh, we, we put in uh, in order to achieve a much more sustainable data center operation culture. Thank you. Thank you. And Michael? For me, I, I don't really have that much more to add other than um, 
of course, looking at one specific system and then being able to say, hey, we're green now, that is completely missing the point, unfortunately. We have to be much more, like I said, holistic in terms of how we approach sustainability. And I have to say, uh, Professor Lee, Professor Tenwi, you, you both have done a wonderful job at illustrating how complex that is even within the data center. So imagine taking just if that's how complex it is within the data center imagine the complexity of the entire ict ecosystem and so i think um, that's something to leave with you all and you can see my recommendations and conclusions in the uh in the uh what's it called in the slides that i i will share with you Definitely. Thank you, Michael. And I apologize I didn't let you finish all your slides, but all the slides uh, with the permission from the speakers, we will put it on the website and do feel free to uh, download it and review it. And uh, let's continue talking because this is certainly not a one-man effort. It's really the combination of everybody. Thank you very much. And this concludes our session. Thank you, Leo, Thank Tui, you. and uh, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye. Yeah, thanks for the time. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye.